get moving. All right, friends. Uh, welcome back to another week of Scriptural Foundations and Justice. And this week and next week, we cap off the, uh, the work that we've done up to this point with updates from the two research teams that were commissioned as part of Capital Area Justice Ministry. So, um, you know, at Capital Area Justice, the Capital Area Justice Ministry is, for those of us that were kind of there, the pastors at the early moment, we're, we're at like three and a half, four years of working on this thing to kind of get to this point. And a few, two months ago, we kicked off the research process and commissioned two large teams, one to look at issues and questions of affordable housing, to dig into the numbers and the experiences and the stories here in Leon County, to get a sense of, of what's going on for folks, and then to begin to, to strategize and think about how we might address that. And we're, we're not quite to that phase, but, but we're, 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 we're to the point where we've had enough meetings and gathered enough information that I think, I think it's appropriate to start to share this broadly. Um, and of course, we have another research team that will report next week with us here on gun violence and criminal justice. And so these are the two core areas. Uh, Blaze, how many folks would you say were on the affordable housing team? I mean, there were a bunch of us in the room. <laughs> there were like 50 on that, on the one call I was on. Yeah. The call today was almost, it was less, it's like 15. But the big one, it was like 15. Yeah. So, I mean, y'all, we, we, we've got... We've had on the affordable housing side, and I'll let the I'll let the folks for the other team speak next week. Um, we've had, you know, upwards of fifty people at some of these things from churches across the community, kind of pooling our collective <laughs> wisdom and <laughs> knowledge and inquiry and question and kind of digging into some of these some of these issues. And so tonight, uh, we have invited here to speak with us, uh, Blaze Benton, who is the uh, I've, I've decided to call it the research director <laughs> at the Florida Housing Coalition. Um, also, maybe uh, maybe more famously known for those of us here at Trinity, uh, uh, married to Gabriella Denton, our very own uh, uh, communications coordinator here at the church, uh, and a father of Luca, who is on screen with us here. Uh, and Blaze is going to give us... Uh, some some context to share a bit through the research process uh, and then here shortly uh, Claire Dodd who is rector's assistant and membership director at St. John's Episcopal will also join us as another member of the team uh, you know if there's one thing that I've learned through working at capital with the capital area justice ministry is we show up in bunches because you're not doing anything by yourself and I think that's healthy in this kind of work, I think it's important for us to be accountable to one another and to show up together. And and I'm I, and and so I, I'm excited that we've got a couple of folks here, part of the research process, to share with us, y'all. This this will be different than the previous weeks. Right? And you, sh I, I hope you all received in your email the, the 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 sheet, the fact sheet, to kind of get a sense of what of what's going on. And then, and out of that, you know, we'll. We'll answer questions and dialogue as best we can. So, Blaze, if you want to yeah. share a bit, we'd love to hear from you, friend. Thank you. I'm gonna take off my glasses. So you were welcome. To... <laughs> you were welcome. Hey, so like uh, Nick was saying, I'm the research manager at the Florida Housing Coalition. Um, so I've been doing this for about three and a half years. Yeah. Uh, but I, as we're working, uh, we're, we do a bunch of stuff. We do a bunch of training. We do a bunch of policy work for nonprofits, uh, or for well, nonprofits, local governments, for the state government, um, just disaster stuff. Uh, but like, so many things don't work. Um, and we live in Florida. You know that I think used to be a moderate state, but for all of my lifetime, it's been a a state that doesn't really fund affordable housing. Uh, so at the state level, we set up a trust fund. In the early 90s, uh, you know, almost uh, actually 30 years ago, I think this year. Um, and then for the last 15 years, you know, as long as I've lived here, uh, they've taken half or more of that every year. Uh, there's been a couple of years where they've taken everything. Uh, and 
other stuff, you know, housing just keeps getting more and more expensive. Um, but one of the groups that really, really worked uh, was DART organizations uh, like uh, Capillary Justice Mission, uh, Ministry. Like I, <laughs> we would work with these groups. We'd work with um, Hope down in Hillsboro. We'd work with uh, Pinellas. Um, we'd work with, uh, yeah, just a bunch of these are peace and rental pieces. Um, Hope County. Yeah. Hope County, yeah. yeah. And they, they were winning. Like, I don't know, you know, like we, we would be doing these, we write policies for like Alachua. And then the you know the uh, city manager would be like, this seems like too much, and it would just get tabled. You know, you'd write a plan or you write policy or I, I, I do a lot of data management, like a, a lot of mapping and demographic stuff, and you write it and people be like, ah, that's cool, and then put it down, <laughs> never look at it again. Um, but like the the dark groups were getting things done. They were getting policy changes. They were getting money from general revenue, from tax dollars put into into housing. Um, they were just like demanding change and it was happening and it was really cool. Um, so, so anyway, so that was sort of before I knew Kajip was happening. Uh, and then I was, uh, I've been going to St. John's uh, for the last three or four months. And I was over um, at St. John's and um, they were talking about uh, Kajip starting up the, the research process. And I was super excited and it was like, I want to be on the other side of, you know, get me involved on the other side of this. Uh, so joined and then joined the, came to the first big meeting and then came to the, the first housing research meeting and then have come to some of the uh, interview meetings since then. Um, and it's just been, it's been a cool process because <laughs> rather like everywhere else, right? It's like, it's a bunch of people. It's a bunch of personalities. <laughs> um, it's takes a lot longer in some ways than you want, but it also happens very fast, right? It's like four or five months, but it also sometimes feels like you're going over the same ground over and over again. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, all these different people asking different questions at all different levels of knowledge about it. Um, but it's just, it, yeah, it's super cool. And I, I'm super glad that it's happening just to see, yeah, like people getting together and doing, making change in a way that yeah, I've seen other places just really works. So um, it's cool. So yeah, that's me. Um, I was gonna talk through this list. Uh, is there any, yeah, you guys have seen it. Um, yeah. Just a general, poverty is really high in the county. Um, poverty also is a meaningless number. Poverty is set at three times the cost of food, which in 1964 when they said it was a meaningful number because food was like a huge budget item for most people. Um, now food is about 10% of our budget. So poverty rate in most people's budget. So the poverty rate means nothing. Like it, I mean, it means something. If you're below the poverty rate, you're, you know, about a third of what a normal family is, is getting, um, which is terrible. But the, the, the number that they cite here, right, is better, that the Alice number. Mm. Um, so that's showing about 50% about of people are below Alice. So that's uh, asset limited. Uh, Income constrained employee. So that's people who are working or making working wages. I think if you uh, certain retirees sometimes accidentally get, get included because it's multiples of this data. Um, but you're making working wages, um, but you don't make enough to support yourself or a family. Um, so if you're a single single person, right? Um, Alice is set at 18, 19, maybe 20, right? And that's so it's still not like, oh, you're making a ton of money. It's like you're making enough that you can afford to live. The, the below Alice, the assumption is that like, if you're saving, right, or if you're if you're making money, you're not saving, and any emergency that happens to you is gonna just pretty much buckle you. Yeah. Um, right. So this is, and, and this is I was reading a, a report, and most families have some kind of emergency every year. You know, somebody loses a job, somebody gets really sick. Your car, my car broke down seven hundred dollars uh, like four months ago, um, and if you are Alice constrained, uh, chances are you know that's causing a, a serious. You're you're going deep into credit card debt. You're going to get a payday loan, uh, you know, and then that starts the cycle. You can't pay your rent. You move in with your parent. You know, like it just it snowballs uh, really really badly. So yeah, about about fifty percent of people in Tallahassee. Now we have a lot of students in Tallahassee, uh, but poverty constrained students are about 10%. So that still leaves about 40% of people that are, um, you know, people that are not students that are below this Alice threshold. 
Um, that's, yeah, that's a huge amount, almost half. Um, so yeah, some zip codes fare worse than others. Uh, 32304, which is actually where I live, is the, one of the poorest uh, areas in the, in the city, or uh, state. It is the poorest area in the city. It's one of the poorest areas in the state. Um, the median income there, I don't remember if it's on the sheet. No, it's on the sheet, but the median income is literally like $25,000. Like it's less than $15 an hour. Um, it also has the highest homicide rate. Yeah, yeah, it's super, yeah, it has a ton of crime and it, it's right, I mean, you go there and it's not even the whole area, it's like, it's yeah. a spot, right? Like you can see it, it's on the corner of, uh, Emerald, do you remember? It's like four blocks from our house. It's, um, but there's like a, yeah, a, a single spot where like uh, a quarter Everything of the crime happens. Has to, happens, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so another thing we talk about with, with uh, housing affordability is tenure, right? So if you're a homeowner or you're a uh, renter, Renters tend to do a lot more poorly than homeowners. Um, homeowning can cost more, um, especially since you have to like, do repairs and stuff in your house, but it's consistent. Um, you generally know how much it is, and also there's the 10% rule, like 10% of your mortgage you should be saving for disasters, and if you're able to do that, it's like pretty, you're pretty protected. Um, whereas renters, it jumps all around, and since the pandemic, rents in Florida have gone up by almost 40%, um, which is nuts. Um, right, I mean, that's not, right, uh, wages have been going up. Actually, low-income wages are above inflation right now, but not in Florida because of our housing. Our housing has gone up so much that any wage increases have just been, have been swallowed. Uh, so yeah, there are 30, as of 2019, over 34,000 uh, low-income families spending more than a half, or no, no, a third, no, it's 30%, it's not actually a third, it's three zero percent uh, of their income on housing. Yeah, so there's a certain amount where like new construction helps, right? So building a bunch more houses help because it removes like housing is ultimately supply demand. So just generally having even market rate housing helps. But the average these people, the low income uh, groups that make up you know like a quarter of Tallahassee, they need rents below uh, seven hundred dollars a month. You can't. Not only can you not build stuff for that, even if you're building new housing and keeping all overall prices like as close to construction costs as possible, just upkeep on a unit tends to cost about $700 a month. So rentals are not going to be that. Even, even in a high supply market, unless you're Detroit, you know, and you just have like no one living there compared to people who used to live there and there's like a bunch of empty units, unless that's happening. And then you have other problems where you have a lot of subpar housing that's got whole for roof rats. Um, it's not going to get down to 700 and so you need other mechanisms for generating housing that's at that level or, or below. Um, the other big thing is just that like, yeah, home ownership tends to be cheaper in the long run, but it's more expensive up front, right? You have to do down payment. Uh, and then often a mortgage is more expensive initially than rents. But as you go, right, I mean, my, my mortgage, my house is a year ago. My mortgage is 11.50, which at the time was like similar to rents. A little bit lower, but also you had to set aside money for upkeep, right? But already that's actually cheaper than I could get a rental, right? For a, a three two. Um, so, yeah, as as you go along, as you live in a house longer, mortgages tend to be much lower than rents because you bought it, and inflation has has okay. come. Um, so yeah, the people who are set rentals, especially as they age, have a lot of problems. So like uh, for low income people, low income homeowners that are older, they mostly have the retirement, even if they're, you know, making $30,000, $40,000 a year or less, they have the retirement to kind of pay for their mortgage or if they paid off their house, pay their taxes and keep their house up. Um, but renters are still paying rent competing against low-income workers. Um, and so having those that money for, for low-income, um, so getting people into home ownership over the long term really improves sort of housing costs. Um, what else have we talked about? Oh yeah, the, this is a, the gap. Um, at the minimum wage of 865, it would take 93 hours of work a week to pay for housing. That's more than two jobs. That's working, you know, <laughs> seven days a week, like uh, 12 hours a day. Um, so it's just not really possible, uh, right? Um, and then, yeah, the city and county, um, 
housing programs. I was saying on the call today, uh, Matt, who runs the county one, is, is brilliant. Um, the program is one of the best in the country. It's like a national model. They get money to people really fast um, and really effectively, and they target need really, really well. So they're doing a good job of what they have, uh, but they don't have a ton of money. And most of the money that they have is really targeted towards the sort of band-aid process, which is necessary as well. You know, if somebody loses their job and they need rent for a month so they can get, now they've got their, you know, to get back into housing or, um, you know, that sort of, you know, they, their roof falls off and so they need to slap it off. But you're not building new affordable units and you're not, uh, yeah, it's just, a, it's a, it's, your, your, your affordable housing stock is going down more slowly than it would and naturally occurring, you know, a housing in the community that's small and in okay condition, but not amazing. That's naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, it's maintaining that, but if you're, you're just getting this sort of, you know, rather than dropping affordability, you're seeing kind of a posting affordability, but it's still a downward trajectory uh, because of both the system and the amount of funds that they have. Uh, yeah, and then this last one, we're just, um, for good reasons, um, a lot of public housing was, or, you know, a lot of public housing was very poor. And so we've moved away from a lot of these traditional building a bunch of public housing models, um, which in a lot of ways is good, because a lot of those, I mean, we're not good places to live, uh, but it, it, we haven't really replaced it. Right. So, you know, so it's it's like a, a lot of these problems uh, in the 80s and 90s, there were these bad systems, um, which was, you know, the same thing with, uh, uh, mental health, like asylums. Asylums were bad, like they were legitimately bad. Um, and so Ronald Reagan closed them. It's like, great, these bad systems ended. It's like, okay, but what are you gonna replace them with so that the people who need help are getting help and they weren't replaced? Um, and so in a, the same way that we, we stopped building public housing, but we did replace them with systems that got low income people into housing in a, a better way, um, or we have just consistently done less funding. Um, and so, yeah, between 2015 and 2024, um, only about 30 uh, low-cost units are going to be built, and several uh, over a thousand, it's like 15, 1,600. I didn't have to look at that number, but over a thousand units are going to drop out. Like uh, they were affordable, but they had a time period, and now they're going to be sold to a for-profit developer who will fix them up and sell them, you know, for a market rate. And I mean, they're they're not going to be like super super expensive because they're you know relatively small units in lower income parts of town, but they're not going to be guaranteed affordable units anymore. Right. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's kind of the list. And yeah, if anybody has any questions, yeah. Yeah, so uh, from your professional path, yeah. what would you say is one of the biggest, either, I don't want to say that groups like ours are ignorant of, but significant issues that groups like ours don't know that we should? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's a couple of things. I, uh, there's a couple of, like community land trusts are a really incredible uh, process. So what you do is you, uh, the uh, nonprofit builds a house, it sells the house, but not the land to a person at a, at a discounted cost. And then they build equity, they own it, but they're only building equity at one, two, three percent a year. And then when they sell it, it sells for one, you know, basically the price of inflation. Um, and so overall the, or slightly below, and so overall the house is maintaining the same value rather than appreciating. Um, and so the house becomes affordable long term. So that's really cool. I, mean, I think another thing is just that like, right, zoning is not natural. Zoning, uh, Euclid versus Amber and Ambler in the early 20th century was a case and they said, we're gonna start um, creating zones where people will can build certain things. There's gonna be a zone for single family homes. Uh, there's gonna be a zone for apartments. There's going to be a zone for commercial, and there's going to be a zone for industrial, right? And uh, cities traditionally weren't zoned like that, or weren't had didn't have that. Um, and one thing that's good, like you don't want a factory and somebody's house. This factory that's poisonous. I mean, it depends on the kind of factory. Right? Yeah. Woodworking factory is fine, but um, you don't want a you don't want a, a noxious factory right next to somebody's house. Right? Like there is a certain amount of separation, but by separating. Uh, single family homes and apartments. They're very explicit where they're like, we want single family homes to be for like nicer people, like wealthier people, you know, the good members of the community. And then the apartments will serve as a barrier 
between those people and the more noxious elements of the commercial and industrial, right? And so it's like a very explicit, you know, there's going to be these single family homes that are for rich people and these um, uh, apartments are going to be for poor people and the poor people are going to get the negative things. They're going to have the traffic through their, their neighborhoods. They're going to have, they're going to be next to industrial. Um, and and it, it really is tied to race really closely, right? Um, so that Euclid versus Ambler was not, it was just class, but um, overwhelmingly for most of the 20th century to, uh, to the Fair Housing Act of the 60s, uh, black people were only allowed to live in a couple of neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods were overwhelmingly, they had very little political power yeah. and were overwhelmingly like industrial commercial uses were forced there. Uh, they were unable to get mortgages and so their homes tended to fall, they didn't own their homes and their homes tend to fall apart because they needed a loan to fix it up. It wasn't gonna happen. Um, and so again, like a lot of zoning has concentrated poor people and more noxious uses in a few places and created these zones of single family homes that are too expensive for most people. Um, and they've, they've intentionally controlled land, right? They're, the single family districts can be nice to live in, but a lot of the, the reason that they exist is we're controlling land so that our housing prices go up, right? Fundamentally, like, there's just a central tension in housing policy in America where, where we want people to be able to afford homes, but also we want homes to be a commodity that always goes up so that people can earn money, right? Um, and single family zoning, what it does is it protects the, it, it just makes, it limits the amount of land that can be developed intentionally. So people who own single family homes, their equity builds and people who don't, uh, have no chance to sort of get into it. Um, and so reducing zoning is important, but it's like, oftentimes when people lower zoning, it's in poor neighborhoods because those people don't have political power. But I think what would make a huge change is actually the opposite, where if you could allow more duplexes, triplexes, small apartment buildings into wealthier neighborhoods, you would start, you would see lower costs and you would see lower costs spread more across the community instead of concentrating in a few neighborhoods that often have very high crime or whatever. Right. Yeah. Anyway. You want to let Claire yeah, go? Claire, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. no, please. All right. So we, we, we have our second speaker, Claire. So, Hi. Yes, please. And then, and, and after you're done, we can kind of open up for discussion more generally. No, no, no. Um, thank you, please. Every time. This is the thing about all of this. Hi, by the way. I'm sorry. My name is Claire Dodd. I um, work as the rector's assistant and membership director over at St. John's Episcopal Church, just a couple of blocks over. Um, I do want to point out that even though I learned about the justice ministry through my job, this is not an extension of my job. I am actually doing this because I want to be doing this. I'm doing this as a member of the St. John's Parish. Um, because I work at St. John's, I end up having a fair amount of insider baseball, which is fun, but I'm honestly here because I want to be. Um, the more I learn about affordable housing, the more questions I have. I'll be completely honest. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and share my story, which some folks may know. Um, I'm born and raised in Tallahassee, left for several years and came back just in time for the pandemic. I mean, really my timing could not have been better. <laughs> um, my mom lives out in Killarn to stay with her for a while, and so I began the task of looking to rent because even though I, my credit was actually quite good where I lived, which is in the UK, um, my credit doesn't exist over here. I couldn't bring it with me. Uh, funnily enough, the person at the bank when I set up my account said, oh, there's been no activity on your social security number for the last 13 years. You don't <laughs> exist here. <laughs> So I was like, oh, oh great. That's, that's something new and exciting to learn. So I, it is not that I have bad credit, it's that I have no credit, which is sometimes worse. So obviously I'm going to rent. I was not ready to, to buy a house yet. Finally managed to find a place. It's very nice. It's a new build. It's technically an in-law suite. It is a one bedroom, one bath, no guaranteed parking. I do park on the street. Um, I pay $1,350 a month for this. Wow. It's just me. 
one person. Where is this? This is um, on Terrace Street, off uh, just near Leon High School. Yeah. So nice yeah. part of town. I, I you know that all the time. To get <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, of course you do. It's a beautiful neighborhood. Um, I I love it. Um, however, uh, I do work for a church, so uh, I am currently paying fifty percent of my monthly income goes towards this apartment. Um, and I am pretty darn sure they're going to raise the rent this summer, which means I probably won't be renewing my lease. One on practicality and two on principle. <laughs> so we'll, we'll come to that in June when, when I have to come to that. Uh, so no, I'm, you know, and that's the thing is I, I have a great job. I have a wonderful job. I, I have a full-time job. I have a very full-time job and it's, it's a very decently paid job. I've got benefits. Um, I have, you know, I've done everything they told you that you were supposed to do, and I am very much still struggling to make ends meet. Um, I can't save. There is no saving. Um, while I am not, I don't think I would personally classify myself as, as um, an Alice in, the, in that community. I am one emergency away, or I am one paycheck away from not being able to make my rents. Um, and the thing is, this was as good as it was going to get. I looked. If I wanted to pay $700 a month for rent, I would need to live with four other people. That, that is the state of, of renting in Tallahassee and the state of attempting to buy on, you know, with no credits, forget it. That's, that's just not even something that I'm considering right now. Um, so, I was already experiencing some issues with affordable housing, and when I heard that the Capital Area Justice Ministry was starting up, I really wanted to get involved. And I didn't even know that we were going to think about affordable housing. I just knew that the town had changed quite a lot since I grew up here. And the thing is, is I actually loved growing up here. I, I can honestly say I had a great childhood here. Um, it was very safe. It was very stable. Um, the schools that I went to were fantastic. Um, I went to FSU, I worked for the state, I did the whole Tallahassee local thing that you're supposed to do, I did it. Um, and so I, I actually really love this town, I really, really do. Um, I'm glad to be back, uh, but it is so fractured and there is so much inequality. I found it really shocking. Just, just how can you have these million dollar homes and I'm sure Trinity has the exact same thing. Being a downtown church, we get some very interesting people off the streets and you can't help them. There's, there's very little that we can do. So when I knew that justice ministry was, was something, I thought, okay, I've got to get involved in this. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the, the procedures and how the justice ministry is working. Um, it is a dark organization, uh, which means it is actually extremely transparent in what it does. There's a lot of training for folks who want to get involved, how to run these meetings, how to reach out to folks within your congregation. Um, they uh, help every step of the way. There's a lot of national resources to talk to. They do a lot of cooperation in between all the various groups. Like if we were to talk to um, the folks down in St. Pete, and I can't remember their group's name, they want to share their successes and their failures and their best practices to help us because there are a lot of organizations across the country facing the exact same problems that we are. Um, it's been also very, very fun, fun um, to do these interviews with people. Um, I was in on an interview week before last with Jean Amison with the city of Tallahassee. She's the housing division manager. And probably like what you were saying about uh, Matthew with the county, she knows what's wrong. And, and she is, I think, to her credit, doing what she can with what she has and with the restrictions that they are under, because a lot comes down from the state. Um, she was very, very open with us. Um, she is still answering follow-up questions. Um, they know something's wrong. They, they are aware. They can't help but be aware, but they are, you know, their hands are tied. They don't have enough money. There's a few things that I still have some questions about that, you know, how tied are their hands? But the process
process has been very, very good because it allows us to look into it. It allows us to talk to these folks who are making the decisions, who are implementing the decisions, um, and just try to get to the bottom of, of, of the story and to figure out what exactly is going on in our community. It's, it's not a comfortable process, I'll be totally honest. Um, growing up in Tallahassee, I am probably as, as Southern as you can get. We are, we don't, we want to be nice. We want to be nice and we want to be polite. And it is very uncomfortable asking people uncomfortable questions. But the thing that I've discovered is by asking them the uncomfortable questions, they want to tell you why. They do want to explain what's going on. So by getting over my discomforts, I'm not a confrontational person at all. Um, I've learned so much. And they, I think, appreciate knowing that people want to do better and want to help the community. Because they live here too. And we really are just basically asking them to do their jobs, you know, to, to tell us about housing, to tell us what it is that they're doing in our community. Um, they need to be transparent. And if we discover a gap, well, aren't we doing our jobs as part of a community to point out that gap and say, well, here it is. Why can't we do this? Why can't we have more affordable rental spaces? Um, you know, what does the zoning mean around here? What is inclusionary zoning? Um, so how, you know, we can get into the nitty gritty about it. Um, so DART has a program for all of this. It has set all of this up um, again extremely transparent. If you want to know about any step along the way, ask any of us, ask Leah, Leah Wiley, and actually ask her if she needs a, a hot beverage or something because the woman is run, run off her feet. Um, please give her a hug the next time you see her. Um, she will tell you where we are. She will tell you exactly what's going on. She'll tell you exactly who in DART to talk to. Um, I wasn't expecting as much organization Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic. You feel involved every single step of the way. And we want you to feel involved every single step of the way. We will answer all the questions that we possibly have. Um, and it's not easy stuff we're asking. And it is not a one and done. You know, even if, say, we decide we want to do a community land trust or a housing land trust where we say, okay, this plot of land is going to be only for affordable renting and say we managed to get the city and the county to say absolutely we totally want you to do that here's the money we will do it you have to keep at it you have to keep on them you have to keep looking into the problems this is it's a marathon um so this is the beginning of the beginning um, we may come away with some not the answers we want um, but we will have gotten a lot of people together in one space and we will have shown the community that the you know, folks in Tallahassee want a better community. So next year we'll try it again and maybe we'll ask a different question and maybe that will be the question that we get a positive to. So that's been my experience so far with Capillary Justice Ministry. Um, honestly, any questions, please ask. Um, and one other thing I will point out about the research is while it has been very interesting and I feel like I need to go back and get a master's in social housing and, you know, the history of housing in America, because, oh my <laughs> goodness, how many theses have been written about redlining? I won't even just, mm. oh my gosh. Um, so it's fascinating and it's terrible and it's amazing and it's exciting. Um, we don't have to know all of the specifics. We have Blaze. <laughs> um, and we also have the folks at the city and we have the folks with the county and we have other outside organizations that have done this work before. So we do not have to be the experts on how to fix affordable housing. We don't have to be the experts on how to fix gun violence in our community. We just have to be bold and we have to ask the questions and we have to say, it's not good enough. We want better. That's really what we have to do at the end of the day. Um, that's what Nehemiah did. You know, he, I am sure he did not know exactly how one was supposed to build the walls and how one was supposed to go about 
getting, you know, ending the loans and, and all of the ins and outs of the economics, but he knew something wasn't right. So he got a bunch of people together and they all said, you got to stop it. This isn't right. Give us our community back. So that's where, that's where I am. We don't have to know all the numbers. We can find all the numbers. We just have to be bold and be brave enough to say we want better because it should be better. Because these are basic rights we're talking about. Housing, safe housing. One of the statistics, and I'll stop after this one, but one of the statistics I learned last week was every time a child moves, they are set back six months educationally educationally and developmentally. Um, one of the ladies who, um, Sister Centoria with Bethelonia, she's a teacher. And she says that she's got two kids in her class that have been constantly moving every year. And she's like, we get them to a point, we get them right to this great stage, they're learning, and then they have to move. And it's back to square one. And it's because they can't find someplace affordable and safe to live. And that's right here. That's that's here. That's that's it's not miles away. It is mm -hmm. a few blocks over. So that's me. That's awesome. Cool. I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, hey, hey uh, uh Zoom Zoom family and everybody in the house here. If y'all uh if y'all wanna don't want to ask something this is a good chance to chat with some of the folks involved in the research process just unmute and give us a go and we can even get on camera if we, if we need to question for blaze how much Money has the legislature taken out of that housing fund? Uh, two and a half billion dollars in the last I think, 20 years. Two and a half billion yeah. dollars. Well, and two and a half billion dollars, right, might not sound like much today. <laughs> <laughs> but think of, you know, 20 years yeah. ago, that's also, or 25 years ago, or whatever, when they started, that's also, you know, mm -hmm. like inflation, right? It's There's an inflationary principle as well. Uh, so, what, what are they doing with this money? It just goes into general revenue. It, yeah. It, it's just yeah. It, right. The census is police force. Well, I mean, it's, it's been it's been twenty five years, right? So it was under, well, was it you know, yeah, Rick Scott, but also, shoot, what was his name? Trying to the Democratic. Uh, Chris, 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 Chris. You know, it's just been. Yeah, it started in ninety two, and it was it was in there for about uh, I think whatever eight ten years, and then um, they realized that while the law said that it had to go into the trust fund. Um, the budgetary procedural law doesn't allow a um, a previous Congress to like you can't do entitlements in the state. You can do recommendations, but ultimately, like the budget is settled year over year by the by the current House. Mm -hmm. And so, even though it's called the Sanowski Housing Trust Fund, you can take the money and put it other places if you want. And so you just use it to fill holes. Every so in year. essence, it's not really a trust. Yeah, it's not a trust fund. It's just a flesh fund. It's a plot. The yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. right. Well, yeah, I think. Um, <sighs> yeah, it's just I don't know. But yeah, definitely going to the first re the first not research meeting, the first meeting just like blew my heart up so much because so often like we can be so like sort of wonky, you know, and like doing our own little thing and like just working with government and just seeing yeah like whatever it was, it was like three or four hundred people just all excited about housing and gun violence. It was like, ah, that's so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> so, hey, Dot, go ahead. Hey, I'll just comment. Uh, the Atlas report was referred to, and I happen to have the 2000 14 Atlas reports still, and I had a chance just to take a quick peek at it. The housing situation was certainly no better. And what really interested me was that only at that time, only about 26% of people were of the county, 
were living in owner owned housing. Mm. A huge number were renting. Mm. So I don't know how that compares to now. Yeah, for in low income people, I, I think there was a number that's not the percent, but it's it's like 75, 80% of I, yeah, like 75, 80% of low income people don't own their houses. Um, and yeah, it's just owning a house is super important in the US. It's like the first rung, you know, towards the middle class and upper middle class, you know, just it, well, and people, you know, if you start a business, most people get equity out of their house and, you know, get a loan. And if you send your kids to college and you're like lower middle income, often you get equity out of your house and you, you know, send them to college. And so it just has so, totally aside from your building equity and your housing costs are being lower, home, owning your own home, like, is such a, like, helps in so many ways to get into, mm -hmm. to like, to build a better life. And um, yeah, it's just harder and harder. Like, home prices compared to incomes are like the farthest they've been in uh, for a really long time. Um, and it's, yeah, costs are now higher than they were um, at the top of the bubble, but it doesn't look like a bubble because there's like 5 million fewer homes compared to the number of people. So it looks kind of like we just have underbuilt homes and we've really underbuilt uh, homes with for like affordability. Mm. Um, and so there's just like a lot of people and a lot of homes. And so they just cost a ton and people can't get on that first rung. And then not only they can't get more expensive housing, but they can't get more. It's hard to start business. It's hard to, you know, uh, pay for college. It's hard to do so many different things. Yeah. Mm. Well, the, this report was a county student's, but it would, of course, include a huge number of people who work for the state, mm -hmm. and that was not very high income population. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. When I I um, volunteered over at Habitat for a little bit, and yeah, that was but all, all of the Habitat owners that I met. You know, because they have to like put in a certain number of work hours. Um, they were all people who were the state, like as secretaries or administrative assistants, or you know, low level um, uh, analysts or whatever. And yeah, you make like you make a consistent wage. You have got good benefits, but it's like thirty to maximum forty thousand dollars, and it's like yeah, not really enough to afford anything and except for habitat which you know puts 10 homes out a year not nearly enough for yeah habitat's fantastic but it is it's yeah. small <laughs> yes pat um i, I don't want to be a debbie downer here but i understood <laughs> the way this process worked was that the next step was going to be to come up with a recommendation for what we were going to try to put forward to local government or local agencies to try to help with the, the problem. I think we all realize there's a problem. We may not realize the exact numbers and things that were discussed tonight, and I appreciate that, but are we making any progress toward a recommendation? You want to chat on that, Claire? I can chat on it as much as I know. And um, I believe the answer is yes. I don't know what that recommendation is quite yet. Um, I do know that, that I, there are a couple of more interviews going on. And as I recall, on the 22nd of February, the team leaders are coming together to talk and I think to have a look at all of the all of the data and see what there is. Because one of the groups that I met with last week actually uh, is change. And they do a lot of work around affordable housing with things like housing land trusts. So if that, that could be something we bring up to the group as something to do, because there are apparently pots of money all over the place and and it's just a matter of getting it designated for what this community needs so the recommendations have not been set in stone but i think we're getting pretty close i don't know about the gun violence folks i do know that i i, I work with kate kyle and she's on that group and she they've definitely been talking to a couple of different people about some mentoring things um 
they've already had an interview with uh, the sheriff, but I think you're probably talking, I assume you're going to be talking next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, next awesome. Week. That's going to be really, really good. Do tune back in for that. Um, so no, we haven't made the recommendation. We are getting very, very close to making that. And as soon as we've got that, y'all will know that. <laughs> okay, so, great. Thank and, you. And, and part of that, and part of that work, Pat, is um, we have started dialogue with, um, we just had a meeting with uh, the, the president of the Bond Neighborhood Association and some of our group um, has committed to reach out to some of the other neighborhood associations in town that, that um, are kind of on the front lines of some of these conversations. And, and I guess what, what we're, we're entering into the phase in the, in the research process where we are now <clears throat> dialoguing with other folks in town to and to see if 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 we have common interests and aims and if and if we and if we find allies out there that have already been working on this and have and, and have asked the city or the county or both for something and haven't been able to move the needle we may be able to, to partner with so so to Claire's point we're you know we're within a few weeks of, of kind of zeroing in on a very, very, very specific ask. And at the end of the day, is that gonna fix the affordable housing issue, the tangle that we're in? No, not this year, you know, but let's, you know, I mean, this is the long haul stuff, right? Let's check back in 15 and, and see, and really see what we've charted. Let's see what we've done. Uh, Cause this is year on year, right? Well, uh, yeah, you don't want that downward slope. <laughs> Yeah. Even if it's slow, it should be getting better every year rather than worse every year. Yeah, what's the what's the old adage about eating the elephant? Yeah, <laughs> one bite at a time. <laughs> and so, so like, I, and and you're like, it's a great, it's a great point. Is we we we're gonna have to we're gonna have to ask for something very specific, and we're gonna have to acknowledge that it will only do what it will do in that instant. Yeah, Don. It seems to me like there are three possibilities raise the salaries, reduce the rents, subsidize the people. What are the other possibilities? I think increasing the number of homes is like another one, right? So that's a very slow process. Well, I mean, it depends on how, you know, you can build a lot of homes pretty fast, but. Yeah, we have, um... You know, uh, early on, we kind of had to make a choice between um, looking at the affordability of home ownership versus rentals, for instance, right? That was that was a pretty critical fork in the road in the research process. And so, one of the one of the stats that we quote in this in this report that from Capital Area Justice is is about the the number of folks that are affected by the rental issue. And, and that's a far larger number than the folks that we're tracking on the home ownership side. So we pivoted kind of, we've pivoted into the rental question at the moment. And then, and then from there, Don, right? How do, you, how do you begin to do something about it? Of course, wages are a huge part of the conversation, but does the city have some existing, or the city or county have some existing tools available? You know, do we have some pots of money designated for affordable housing? Sure enough, we do. Right? We have some programs and some monies assigned, but what are they doing? How are they doing it? And do they need more to do the work that they are doing? And so, um, and so I, I, you know, for me and my conversations in these meetings, and again, you know, you can imagine a table of, of 12 folks sitting around that have been part of this, all kind of, yeah. right? and, and, and sometimes the table gets way bigger than that, trying to kind of narrow in on the thing. Um, you know, I, I, I keep looking at, at kind of the, the power of renters, right? How do you empower renters as a, as a unit, right? How do you, what can we do to make that possible? Uh, and, and that's not, a, that's not a simple question at the moment. Like it's not, uh, but, but is there a way to, to, uh, to, to, to interject ourselves into the cost of housing for the renters so that monthly they have more more cash on hand because they're just they're not spending 50 percent on what they're renting right and so so how can you how can you given the given where we are how can 
can we how can we how can we bring the the wage right the monthly cash flow this way and and I think I think it's going to have to be programs on the housing side because Don I don't I don't see us touching wages um, right now right and and that 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 actually feels like it's a little far afield at the moment. Well, and that's such a state national mm -hmm. thing. Um, we're really trying to see what we can do locally and. Well, I really applaud any effort to get someone into the home ownership. There are going to be people in our community who are never going to be in the home ownership realm. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen, whether that's because of some health issues, um, you know, disabilities, they cannot have a home, their, your, their credit is never going to be good. Um, we, well, this is Tallahassee, it's incredibly transitory. You know, we've got the government, we've got the university. Some people are going to move here and only be here for a while. But again, they shouldn't be having to spend an absurd amount every month. So I, I think that's one of the reasons we focused on the rental. Yeah, we've been. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. So the, you know, we've got the, we've got a, a, a pep rally plan, and y'all be on the lookout. Our, our communications team here at Trinity. Uh, namely, uh, Gabriella uh, is putting together. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure you saw it in news and notes this week, right? We're sharing bits along the way. Come join us for this conversation. That's going to ramp up as we get going. And we have our we have our pep rally, which is you know what's the March what's, the eighth. I think it's March eighth, and that's when the night of March eighth. So be on the lookout for that for that announcement and that'll be in person and we're looking for a, a place to have it right now but that'll be where we where the the research teams roll out the recommendation to the to the broader body right we'll roll that out at that meeting so we, we've got to have an answer in a couple of weeks <laughs> like we we put it on the calendar i mean it's, it's where i mean we, we got to come up with something yeah jerry did i see your name yeah yeah um <laughs> Like see, one thing that's sort of missing from all this, and it's interesting to me, this all you're talking, it, it's being talked about as sort of a, a bottom-up effort. And we're talking about does the city, the county, the local government have any money? And you know, the big elephant's not in this room is the state. And those of us, some of us who worked in government in the 70s, 70s and 80s, remember when the state had uh, interest in this and when there was people in the legislature and in the leadership in the legislature that cared about things like this. And we've gotten to the point now it, it started going downhill. Well, like when Rick Scott became governor, one of those main accomplishments from his perspective was abolishing the Department of Community Affairs. Well, the mm -hmm. Department of Community Affairs probably got abolished because they did growth management and the big developers didn't like growth management. And so they took them out, uh, out of the picture. But they also did emergency management. And the third big part of them was housing and community development. Now, a lot of these programs have probably ended up in other departments. But back then, you had a whole agency that was focused on these issues. And we don't have that now. And we also, from what I've seen, don't have people in the legislature. There's some who care, but they're so far outnumbered and outvoted who care about things like this. And, and you know, that wasn't always the case. And that's where the big money is. And that's where you can make a difference. And, and you, you can see there are other states and big cities like New York where they, you know, they do a lot of massive housing programs. You can see and they issue bonds like crazy. And, um, but, you know, it, it's a shame that we're at that point where we have to be saying, does the city have any money or the county? Or, we're not yeah. even talking about the state because it's such a lost cause these days. Well, and, and I'll say this. Uh, so we have, do y'all, uh, we have 12 or 13 DART organizations in Florida, in different places, uh, Pinellas, um, uh, 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 I, I, don't, I can't name them all. Anyway, uh, we have, we have, um, uh, all right, we'll see y'all. We'll, I we'll promise we're going to get him home real soon. <laughs> um, uh, we, um. The DART organizations a decade ago in the state started working on collectively each in their individual pockets started working on issues of civil citations, mm -hmm. for instance, look at the bottom up, right? Started working on it with, with uh, sheriffs and local law enforcement to institute civil citation programs. And eventually it got to the point where enough of the organizations had worked on it enough at the time that, that they began to work together, coordinated and pressured the legislature into, into a civil citation program that's statewide. Now it takes time 
to build that kind of capacity. And honestly, right, the type of organizing that we're talking about here, it just, it, it takes a while to build capacity that could affect statewide legislation. Do I think it's possible out of this? Yes. Do I think it's necessary? Honestly, yeah. Like, I think, I think we've got to have that conversation. And so, you know, for me, it's, you know, I, my, 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 uh, my, uh, my political practice is always, let's, let's get the thing I can grab, right? the thing I can get right now. And let's build capacity, build capacity, build capacity, and maybe we can have that dialogue. Because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in total agreement, Jerry. Like if we're not, if we're not getting, getting right, the Sadowski Fund is a prime example of of what's happening in, at the at the at the state legislature in terms of. A, a term yeah, of and let me remind you, Bill Sadowski, in addition to being one of the probably best legislators we've ever had in Florida, he was also the secretary of DCA. Yeah. And so his agency that he was the head of when he died in a plane crash, you know, the tribute to him was they abolished it, abolished the entire agency. So that's the way things are in Florida right now, unfortunately, and at the state level, particularly in the legislature. Well, and if we're people, right, we, we've established over the last four weeks, we're folks that are called to this work. Like we don't, we don't get to sit it out, right? We, this, this is part of our charge as disciples. Is to is is to step into these places and to do this work to ask the tough questions to get uncomfortable, Claire, in some of these conversations and advocate. You know, the big four keep showing up in scripture again and again and again. Right? The 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 widow, the orphan, the immigrant, and the impoverished keep showing up again and again. And those are the those are the most vulnerable people in in the societies that we have accounted for in the witness of scripture. And here we are trying to do our piece in that too, for all of our sakes. And for our call to ministry, um, so yeah, I, yeah. I mean, this is this is long work, uh, and I'm, I'm I appreciate everybody who's on tonight, everybody who's who's been a part of the research process, everybody who's answered the call, either be a team leader here at Trinity or join a network. If you haven't heard from somebody or haven't got a chance, trust us. The 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 opportunities to hop in and to on ramp into this are coming, and they will be coming. They will be coming quickly uh, over the next over the next month. And so, so keep an eye out for news and notes. Keep an keep a, keep an ear out for announcements on Sunday morning. Uh, keep a lookout for uh, for invitations to join into this work in new ways. And let's you know let's buy into it as a church and 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 do it. We can't let St. John's be right. <laughs> right this doing all of it. Right? This got, is the kind of competition I am. This is really this is yes yes. Temple Israel is turning folks out, and I'm not gonna know. Temple Israel won. Temple yeah, Israel in the last yeah. gathering, we yeah. were we were close, but Temple <laughs> Israel got us. So um, yeah, look, we've got work to do. So I look, I appreciate every one of y'all, uh, Blaze, Claire. Thank y'all so much for coming to share. What a what a what a beautiful ministry. What a beautiful opportunity to collaborate together uh, and and do some kingdom work here in the community. Um, everybody, God bless. Y'all have a great night, and and I'll see you next week. What do you think? Yeah. All right. <laughs>